All right, good morning. It is March 29, 2024. This is the second turf team times from the OH2 Turf Grass team. Um, and we have decidedly started to think that spring is starting to appear. Uh, although we were just discussing soil temperatures are still only in the mid 40s uh, in multiple situations under at the two inch depth. Now it is under a higher cut turf. Um, I'd be interested to see what it might be on the sand based root zone. Uh, but it doesn't seem like we're climbing as quickly as we might be thinking. Um, online today, we've got Dr. Tyler Carr, we've got Dr. Dave Gardner, we've got Pamela Stratz. Happy birthday, Pamela. Uh, happy birthday, Dr. Carr as well, sorry. Uh, Dr. Wu and the indefatigable Mr. Todd Hicks. Dr. Gardner, lead the way. All right. So here we are at the end of March and starting to see and hear reports of our friend Lester Celandine making its annual return. So um, this is in the Ranunculaceae family, which there's a lot of ornamentals in this family. And so that's why this was brought over here. Uh, it just happens that uh, in addition to being pretty, it's also really good at spreading all over the place. Um, devastating consequences in woodlands. It's like this is the understory ground cover plant for where all of the Bradford pears and the honeysuckles are. But um, you do occasionally see it um, infesting turf grass too, which is a problem. So again, introduced as an ornamental, uh, they call it fig butter cup or pile wart also. The good news is, is that it's not here year round. The bad news is, is that it is an invasive species that um, forms bulbs underground and quite a few of them. So if you see this particular plant, one of the things that you can do in turf is to just remove the bulbs. So basically dig them up like you're harvesting onions. You can attempt to use non-selective herbicides like glyphosate and the temperature should be above 50 degrees. Now, obviously, if it's growing in turf, that's going to cause you a problem, right? Because then you'll have to reseed or resod. And so if you're going to attempt selective control in turf, well, that's kind of difficult because chemical manufacturers aren't trying real hard to control ornamental plants. And so there's not really a lot of herbicides that are specific for this particular weed. They're trying, but it's just not there yet. In the meantime, if you can find a combination product that contains at least two of the three following ingredients, MCPA, triclopyr, or dicamba, that is thought to be relatively more effective for the control of this plant. Something else that I note is that during the springtime, all of our different grass species have kind of a different point on the calendar that they start to wake up and grow. And so depending on the composition of your turf stand, you might see something that looks not too dissimilar to this, where you have a lot of grasses in there that seem like they're weedy grasses and they're causing a big problem because they're growing a lot more quickly than, um, you know, the Kentucky bluegrass and the perennial ryegrass. Uh, you know, generally speaking, if, unless it is rough bluegrass or quack grass pictured here or orchard grass, um, usually those plants kind of fade out uh, during the month of May as the bluegrass and ryegrass um, start to grow and you're mowing more frequently. Um, but at this time of the year, there's a lot of grasses that you see um, in a turf stand that you really won't pay any attention to during the uh, um, summer months, but you know they're, they're pretty visible right now. So like I said, as long as it isn't orchard grass, quack grass, or rough bluegrass, um, you know, you probably could safely ignore um, those, those species. Now, quack grass and orchard grass you can only remove with Roundup. Rough bluegrass, we're, we have some selective options, um, not the least of which is uh, bispyrobac sodium is coming back as Velocity PM this year from uh, New Farm. So that is a potential option for selective removal of rough bluegrass in perennial ryegrass or tall fescue, a little bit more difficult proposition in Kentucky bluegrass. Now for crabgrass, this is um, the uh, uh, what GDD tracker looked like this morning. So this is a Michigan State website. Note there is a new address if you've used this in the past. It's a free service and it does track several pests, but here what I'm showing is that um, the uh, timing for application of pre-emergence herbicides for crabgrass control, the northern half of the state we're still in what you would call the optimum timing. The southern part of the state we're starting to get into what you would consider the late stages of when we would recommend putting out a pre-emergence herbicide. That said, I like to recommend putting these out as late as you can possibly do it and get away with it because that makes it more likely that you'll have a good barrier during the month of June when you still have a lot of crabgrass germinating. 
So, you know, that said, we are having an above normal temperature spring. Uh, and so, you know, like if you had typically seen crabgrass germinating the latter part of April, that might be um, pushed forward about a week to a week and a half, um, depending on your conditions. So prodiamine and all other pre-emergence herbicides apply between now and April 10th. Dithiapyr, you can get away until you're at the one to two leaf stage, so long as it's the liquid formulation. So that one does have early post activity if you spray the liquid. Something else, though, and it breaks my heart every year, is that um, I will get a call from somebody that says, hey, we were going to do some reseeding, and um, we put down some prodiamine or some dithiopure or whatever, and how long do we have to wait until we can reseed? And it's like, well, depending on the active ingredient, it can be a good long time, um, anywhere up to four to six months. Now, the good news is, is that puts you back into the window when you should be making the uh, seeding um, anyway, you know, August, September. But uh, most of those pre-emergent herbicides do a really good job of also preventing bluegrass, ryegrass, and tall fescue from germinating. The one exception, though, is mesotrione, which is safe at seeding. And actually, we've had fantastic results with that product. Um, it literally only allows bluegrass, ryegrass, and tall fescue to germinate. Everything else turns white, and then it goes away, and it's kind of cool. And so that's what I have for today. Uh, Dave, as just before we switch to Pamela Sharat, there is a lot of weeds emerging this time of year, correct? There is, yes. And people will get mixed up with stuff, right? They will. Yeah, so actually, yeah, I think Pam's going to talk about that a little bit. Um, yeah, not, not weed comes up about three weeks in advance of crabgrass and sometimes looks like crabgrass when it's coming up, but I don't want to steal her thunder. That wasn't it. You were going to lead that off uh, to lead her up to it. Pamela. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Yes, I just literally went out into my yard. Um, actually, there's cracks between these flagstones leading up to my front steps is where we, I find this weed because it will thrive. It will survive in compacted soil, very compacted soil. So I see this down the middle of football fields and in high traffic areas on sports, other high traffic areas. This is prostrate knotweed. It gets mistaken for crabgrass, but it is actually a broadleaf summer annual. It has that purple base um, and it will thrive. It is able to survive in very, very compacted soil areas. Um, I don't believe it's on the label. It's on the Mesotrione label. So Dave, what would be uh, what would be some, if, if sports field managers need to seed, but they've got this in their high traffic areas, how, what would be your recommendation for control? If it's emerged now and they're seeding, that's that's actually kind of a difficult thing to deal with because if they use a post-emergence herbicide, one, those tend to be a little bit less effective in cooler weather, even if it's an ester formulation. But the other thing is, is that you have to look at the label because there's a period of time that you have to wait before you, you can seed after you've put a post-emergence herbicide out. And that's usually like a two to three week period. So um, yeah, I, I, I don't have a particularly good answer for you there. Um, you, the pre-emergence herbicides that are not, uh, uh, you know, like prodiamine and dithiopyr will do a relatively good job of preventing knotweed from coming in, but those are the ones that also do a relatively good job of pre preventing Kentucky bluegrass and perennial ryegrass from germinating as well. So unfortunately, um, that's, that's kind of a difficult situation. Okay. Thanks, Thank Dave. You. That was really helpful. <laughs> so no, the next Dave. thing I wanted to mention, um, Ed, you had said that the soil temperatures at two inches were about 45 degrees. Um, for those of you that don't know, if you just Google uh, OARDC weather station, um, there are weather stations all over the state. And so we have one in Columbus and we ch I checked it this morning again, look at those soil temperatures. Uh, everything usually wakes up around 50 degrees other than prostrate knotweed. Uh, which is one of the first to, to germinate. Everything wakes up around 50 degrees, so we need to start tracking for weeds and, and grass seed germination. We, that's sort of the golden number. Once the soil temperatures are consistently above 50, you can get your grass seed out. Um, now, I put some grass seed out about three weeks ago and uh, did actually see some, some of that seed has popped, especially in like protected areas. Uh, I did see that I've had some germination this morning. So I was a little worried because uh, I've had this grass seed for a couple of years and I store it, I do store it in a dry, um, cool place, but I was worried whether it was still viable. And, and so I just wanted to share, if, you're, if you do put grass seed out, 
and you don't see germination or you're worried about viability, um, just get about a hundred, count out about a hundred seeds. You can put it in a wet, moist uh, piece of kitchen roll, a paper towel, and put that in a Ziploc bag and store it somewhere warm. And after about a week or so, you should be able to see if that grass seed has germinated. Um, now there might be some more visual signs. You know, you might see mold, you might see, you know, mouse poop in there, uh, it might smell bad. There's other, other signs that you can say, okay, this seed's done, I'm not gonna use it anymore. But if it looks like it might be okay and you're just worried about that germination, the viability, that's a small test that you can do. And I, the reason I say count it out is because you want you want a good portion of that seed to germinate. If it's if you only get about thirty percent germinate, you might you might look at again pitching that old seed and buying new. Um, as far as uh, germination, yeah, I've got a little bit of germination popping right now in my yard, and I'm going to pass on to Dr. Carr, who I think is also going to talk. A little, a little bit about seeding this spring. Dr. Carr, just one thing, Pam. Uh, people might be wondering why seed prices have gotten so expensive. Uh, multiple reasons. Uh, they've had problems out in the Pacific Northwest with uh, controlling some of the rodents who do damage to the fields. Uh, fires in Canada actually also have an impact on seed prices. Um, and the other issue is weed weed control out there seems to be somewhat problematic as well. Um, not completely out of control, but it, it is making it more difficult for them. So uh, seed prices have uh, increased for a multitude of reasons. Dr. Carr. Yeah, so many of you are probably like Pam and I'm the same way. I need to put some seed out in my backyard. Um, and we've touched on a couple of these items that are related to, you know, it's time to plant seeds. Seed, seed can germinate, but also these weeds are germinating. So I did want to touch back to Dr. Gardner about uh, tenacity or mesotrione applications at seeding. So is that, do we want to kind of wait until later in the window of, of seeding uh, for these mesotrione applications? So like if we're, if we want to have some pre-activity do we still want to, we want to time that later or is it okay to just go ahead and put that out with seed now and the seed will germinate whenever, um, the seed will germinate whenever soil temperatures are appropriate? I would say, um, that the main issue with the springtime establishment is usually going to be crabgrass. Uh, you'll, you'll have all variety of annual weeds that will try to compete, uh, also nutsedge, but crabgrass is the one that tends to be the more problematic. And the issue that I've seen is, is that depending on the grass that you're trying to establish, sometimes the tenacity will help mesotrion. Sometimes the mesotrion will help to beat back the crabgrass, but you won't get um, good enough control to allow you to get a good establishment of the turf. So, uh, for example, planting uh, uh, Kentucky bluegrass in the month of May, even if you're using mesotrione, tends to not give you a satisfactory result. Because perennial ryegrass establishes a little bit more quickly, sometimes you can get away with that. But the main thing is, is that while uh, mesotrione will help with the springtime establishment, significantly help. Um, it's still a good idea to try to time the establishment, the seeding, so that you're avoiding that window when most of the crabgrass is germinating, which is during the month of May. So I would say now is going to give you a better result than if you try to um, wait until May 1. And then, you know, like if you're not able to do it um, uh, now, then I would say, you know, hold off until late May, early June. Um, because again, it, and this, you know, perhaps isn't something that you would uh, have to do if you don't have a history of severe crabgrass infestation in the area where you're trying to do the seeding. But if you do, um, it, it, again, it's, it's, it's a great product for this purpose, but um, particularly if you're trying to seed Kentucky bluegrass, sometimes it won't be enough to um, allow you to have a successful establishment. So yeah, Kentucky bluegrass right now, if we're if we're seeding Kentucky bluegrass, we we will probably not see a complete establishment until June if temperatures are are adequate. Um, and so that's you know a couple things that we want to consider uh, if you're putting seed out right now. One, we don't really recommend seeding at this time as the primary seeding. 
you know, that's going to be a fall, fall seeding. But if you have bare areas, you need to put something down. Um, with a lot of the rainfall that we'll get in the, in the spring, it's good to have some kind of uh, mulch over it, whether that's straw or I like to use uh, harvested grass clippings for some areas. Uh, just something that's going to keep it keep the seed from washing away. Um, last thing is if if people have dormant seeded, um, they may be wondering, okay, I put some seed out, you know, maybe in January or February. What should I do about herbicide options? Uh, what are my options? So, Dave, do you have any any recommendations for um, how they should? tackle their or program for herbicides um, if they put put seed out as a dormant app or dormant planting. If they dormant seeded, then um, they can look to see um, you know, if they don't have any germination yet, then I, I, I would avoid um, any herbicide application period, unfortunately, because uh, you know, with, with mesotrione even, you know, like they say to, uh, you can apply it on the day that you're putting out the seed, but then after that, there's a window of time that they recommend you not make the application. So if any of those seedlings had germinated, um, they're going to be damaged by the application. So um, with the dormant seeding, I would say kind of um, hold pad and uh, um, not apply anything. Key theme today is that there are lots of weeds coming out. Grass is just now starting to grow. And so Dr. Gardner is going to take the, take the floor for most of this. So I yield my time. <laughs> Dr. Gardner brought to you today by the words music, try on crabgrass, not weed and any other seeded related thing as well. Uh, Dr. Wu insect update. Good morning, everyone. Um, I will provide some update on the annual uh, brucos weevil. Um, so so right now, the um, uh, last time I mentioned about two indicated plants um, for Cynthia and Eastern Red Bud um, for the air dog activities. And so right now, the for is is uh, leafing, start leafing, um, as shown in the picture. And also Eastern Red Bud um, have the flower buds and not open yet. So um, they're going to approach early bloom soon. And so for the for the, we are still doing the soap flushing and uh, linear P for traps to check the wave activities. And so uh, in soap flushing, um, the results uh, really vary with the size and locations. And the highest count we have so far is 39 per square feet, uh, which was in one of the golf courses in Cincinnati, um, we check on Monday. And so um, in some other sites and locations, they were lower. And the people traps are still catching weevils. Um, it's it's hard to imagine even the like a uh, cold weather like last week they were still moving, and so this week what we our counts um it's uh, mostly thirty three to forty five, but the highest count was sixty five. Um, that's from one week trap. And so in addition to um doing this uh, monitoring, we're also checking. Um, the, the adult reproductive development, because that tells when the adults are ready to lay eggs. So we have been done a lot of, um, uh, we have been doing a lot of insect dissection and looking at the male and the female uh, reproductive systems. Um, so in this picture, it shows the uh, female reproductive system. Um, the left figure shows the undeveloped one and the right figure shows the developed. So you can see the eggs. Um, um, it's, it's passing through. And so um, in our dissection this week, um, we in the, uh, this is Cincinnati samples, um, over 90% of the females had eggs and averaging three to eight eggs per female. And this is uh, higher than the previous samples uh, we did. And also about 80 um, to 100% that were inseminated means they have sperms in the spermifica. So when you look at the dissection picture here, you can say um, it's uh, there are many eggs inside the canics. And also this is an orange like a hook. It's a spermifica in the female weevil that is used to store sperms. 
And when you um, like you look at the high compound microscope, uh, high resolution, and you can look at the sperms actually being released, um, you can crack it open and see that. And the females, we can see here's a con uh, convex, um, like it's sticking out, what do we say? And um, here's the male uh, reproductive system. Uh, this is an undeveloped one, and this is a developed one. Um, so in our samples, we collected this week, um, uh, in Cincinnati area, about 60 to 70% of males were fully developed, um, means they are ready to mate and um, to reproduce. And about 30% are still uh, partially developed. And, um, and the males, you can see here, it's uh, like a ditch, like a concave in the, in the abdomen. So um, when you do so flashing, you may notice that there's um, a white worm, uh, kind of small, looks like um, a nematode vein. So if you see that, it's uh, that's no panic. Um, when you look at um, the magnification under the microscope, you can see there's a segment and some CTs. Um, so this is a, a typical characteristic of the pot worms. Um, they just like uh, moist and um, uh, organic moist conditions uh, rich in organic matters. So there's no worry that they will cause, they will damage your, your norm. Um, okay. So talking about control, and so in the fact sheet, um, my student and I um, developed uh, ABW, there have been uh, control options. So I'll say that um, um, next week will be a good time to spray um, the adult size, if your um, density is reaching 10 weevils per square feet or higher, and um, the, some pyrophores are good options to control, but you need to use with caution if you have uh, resistant uh, problems. And so because it's a con this uh, pyrophores are contact insecticides, so uh, we need to keep them on the surface for at least a tw uh, 24 hours after spray. So do not irritate, irrigate or mow within 24 hours after spray and also avoid um, uh, spraying right before a uh, heavy rain because the chemicals can be washed off. Um, so looking at the weather, it looks like it's going to rain tomorrow um, and also till next Wednesday. So I assume that um, uh, after rain, when the condition announced uh, spraying later next week will be a good timing. And um, that's all I have. Here's my contact information. If you have any questions, thank you. Dr. Wu, I did not have on my bingo card this morning the reproductive parts of ABW. That was fantastic. Thank you. Thank Todd you. Todd Hicks, try and beat that, buddy. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I'm going to beat that one. That was uh, pretty good. Um, but so far, diseases for the month of March. Um, my phone started uh, beeping, getting texts and uh, getting pictures and samples coming in about two weeks ago. We started off with a little snow mold, mostly in our upper northern regions on golf courses and uh, a little uh, red thread in central Ohio. Nothing big, but it was the first confirmed report. Uh, those have both slowed down greatly with the cool down after the tornadoes came through and and the, the weather changed on us. Um, uh, I, the biggest part of the samples I've received this week have not been diseases. It's actually been a, a poetry of rough stock bluegrass. Homeowners are really noticing that this year, uh, even before it goes dormant later in the summer. So uh, I've been kind of harping in the last two years that that's going to become more and more of a problem. And it, it seems like it, it has really become a problem for homeowners we're going to be dealing with the next few years. Um, looking forward to the next uh, two weeks, as everyone talks about, the, at least for Central Ohio, it looks like out of 14 days, we're somewhere between 10 and 12 days of 50% chance or more of rain. Uh, and it looks fairly cool. So my big concerns uh, are snow mold uh, increasing or starting up uh, with all this cool wet weather and or leaf spot. Um, so if you haven't got protection on, I would try to get something out before um, Easter or the very start of the week if you can still get it out before the rains to get that protection down. Because two weeks is a really long time to be cool and wet and not have protection at this time of year. But that's that's about it so far disease-wise. 
Thanks, Todd. One thing to keep in mind is that with these cool temperatures and high sunlight, that sometimes leaf spot gets confused for anthocyanin pigments. And so reach out to Todd if you're not sure, um, because the purpling and segregation can be more related to physiology than uh, actual plant pests. All right, Dr. Carr, you want to put up our contact details? Thank you, everyone. We'll be back in two weeks' time. Uh, as we continue through the season. Uh, and if you want to get a hold of us, you've got the website, bookaiturf.osu.edu. You can email us. Uh, and then there's the various uh, ways to reach us on social media. Um, with that, we wrap it up. Uh, and we will all have a very nice weekend and we will talk to you soon.